As you know, the Messiah will come and save this world. There have been many prophecies about this Messiah, and many people have wondered about him. In the Bible, our Savior and that of all Jews is Jesus. Many people believe that former Israeli President Benjamin Netanyahu will make unexpected revelations about salvation next month. Really amazing, right? In today's video, let's explore these details together. Please watch the entire video to get answers to these questions and not miss the shocking truth that I will reveal at the end of the video to be able to go deeper into this issue. Firstly, we must understand the Messiah. Messiah, or Christ, is the title of the Savior recorded in the Bible. The original Hebrew word Messiah means anointed. This word was often used by the Jews to refer to an anointed one and was also used to refer to the anointed. Jews also use this title with another special meaning to call the Savior that the Jews are waiting for. That Savior is the Messiah. Christians believe that the Messiah predicted in the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. The title Messiah in the Old Testament also has another special meaning. God promised King David that the kingship of David's descendants would last forever. Fikeo Samuel 7.16 That promise was told by prophet Nathan to David when the king was still in power. Several centuries later, when the Jews sinned against God and faced the prospect of losing their country, the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel prophesied the Savior promised by God would come to liberate the Jewish people from their misery. The prophet Isaiah said that the Savior would appear in the form of a baby named Emmanuel, Isaiah 7, 14, 17, who would come from the lineage of David, Isaiah 9, 6, minus 7. That Savior will rule over God's people in eternal righteousness, peace, and security, Isaiah 11, 1, 9, Jeremiah 33, 14, 26, Ezekiel Chiel 37, 24, 28. In addition to the proclamations of the prophets, the Old Testament clearly states that the Savior is the one chosen and anointed by God, Psalm 45, 7, who will be called the Son of God, Book in Samuel 7, 14, and His kingdom will endure forever, Psalm 89, 4, 36, 37. Based on prophecies in the Old Testament, the Jews looked forward to someone born from the lineage of King David who would be anointed with holy oil, become king of the Jews, and rule the kingdom of God. The Jews called him Messiah ben David, which means anointed one, son of David. That Savior will be a great leader who rules by the laws of Judaism. Messiah has a much deeper meaning. First, believers believe that the Messiah God promised is not just the Messiah God promised David and will be born from David's lineage, 2 Samuel L 7 16. But it is also the one whom God promised to the fathers of mankind, Adam and Eve. And that one shall be born of the seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15. Jesus is the only one who fulfilled both of the above prophecies. When Jesus was still alive on earth, he warned the Jews about their mistaken and limited concept of the Messiah. That concept is incomplete and can cause misunderstandings. Jesus once asked the Jewish scholars, What do you think about Christ? Whose son are you? Educated in traditional Judaism, Jewish scholars quickly responded, son of David. Jesus asked the question, If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply, and from that day on no one dared to ask him any more questions. Matthew 22, 41, 46 When they heard Jesus ask that question and quoted Psalm 110, one to prove it, the Jewish scholars remained silent and did not answer because they realized that the traditional concept that they completely trusted was not true, that God taught in the Bible. Second, while the Jews expected a liberator who would restore the glory of Zion and rule in righteousness, Psalm 45, 3, 7, 72, 1, 4, E, Isaiah 11, 1, 5. Based on the Old Testament, believers believe that God's promised Messiah will be opposed, Psalm 2, 2, and killed, Daniel 9, 29, then the Messiah will return once more to rule over his people in eternal righteousness, peace, and security. The prophecy about the Messiah being opposed and killed was fulfilled in Jesus. While the Jews expected the Messiah to appear, believers believed that the Messiah had come. Jesus Christ has partly fulfilled the predictions about the Messiah. He has gone to heaven and will return to do other things that God has promised. Believers look forward to the second coming of Jesus to live happily in His everlasting and eternal kingdom. 
Third, the Old Testament also records a number of other prophecies about the Messiah, and these are impossible for humans. The Messiah not only rules the world, Psalm 208, but rules forever, Isaiah 9-7. His origin is from eternity, Micah 5-2. The prophet Isaiah called him Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9-7. These characteristics are found only in God. Because Jesus is God become man, he has the nature of God. Therefore, believers have enough elements to believe that Jesus is the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament. Therefore, Jesus is not only the Savior of the Jews, but also the Savior of all humanity. The Requirements That the Jewish Messiah Must Meet In the tapestry of Jewish teachings, the concept of the Messiah, or as we often hear it, Moshiach, weaves a narrative of hope and anticipation deeply rooted in the faith's traditions. Rather than a mere title, Moshiach translates to anointed, signifying someone specially chosen by God for a grand purpose. Judaism's belief in the Messiah emanates from divine teachings passed down through generations, each verse meticulously studied for clues about this chosen figure. According to these teachings, the Messiah holds a pivotal role, foretold in sacred texts like the Bible. Firstly, the Messiah must be of Jewish descent, a crucial stipulation echoed in verses such as Deuteronomy 17.15. Furthermore, prophecy dictates that this chosen one will hail from the tribe of Judah, tracing lineage back to the revered King David and King Solomon, as referenced in Genesis 49, 10, Psalms 89, 29, 38, and Jeremiah 33, 17. The Messiah's mission extends far beyond individual salvation, encompassing the collective destiny of the Jewish people. Their duty includes gathering the scattered Jewish community and leading them back to Israel, symbolized in passages like Isaiah 27, 12, 13, and Isaiah 11:12. Moreover, they are tasked with the monumental feat of rebuilding the sacred Jewish temple in Jerusalem, as prophesied in Micah 4, 1. Yet the Messiah's ultimate purpose transcends borders, heralding a time of unprecedented peace for all humanity. This vision is painted vividly in scriptures like Isaiah 2, 4, Isaiah 11, 6, and Micah 4, 3 where swords are to be turned into plowshares and lions will lay down with lambs. Central to the Messiah's mission is the establishment of monotheism, where all hearts and minds unite in the worship of one God. This divine calling is encapsulated in verses such as Isaiah 11, 9, Isaiah 45, and Zephaniah 3, 9, echoing the core tenet of Jewish faith. In Ezekiel's writings, particularly in chapters 37, 24, 28, the anticipation of the Messiah reaches its crescendo. Described as my servant David, the Messiah is envisioned as a righteous king who will lead the Jewish people to spiritual fulfillment and everlasting peace, where God's presence will dwell among them eternally. However, Judaism's perspective on Jesus of Nazareth diverges significantly from Christian theology. While some historical Jewish figures regarded Jesus with skepticism, others like Judah Halevi and Maimonides acknowledged his role in paving the way for ethical monotheism. Modern Jewish thinkers, including Jacob Emden and Moses Mendelssohn, have contemplated Jesus' Jewish identity, offering nuanced interpretations that challenge conventional narratives. In essence, the concept of the Messiah serves as a beacon of hope and unity in Judaism, embodying the collective aspirations of a faith deeply rooted in tradition and prophecy. While interpretations may vary, the anticipation of a future marked by divine redemption and universal peace remains steadfast in the hearts of believers. What prevented Jesus from being the Jewish Messiah? When we dig into the nitty-gritty of the Messiah criteria, it becomes apparent that Jesus, while Jewish by birth, doesn't quite fit the bill according to Jewish teachings. One major sticking point is his family tree. The New Testament claims Jesus didn't have a human father, which poses a problem because Jewish lineage is traditionally passed down through the father's line. This means Jesus couldn't trace his ancestry back to the tribe of Judah or the lineage of King David and King Solomon, essential qualifications for the Messiah. Moreover, attempts to link Jesus' lineage through his adoptive father Joseph hit another roadblock. According to the New Testament, Joseph's lineage traces back to King Jeconiah, who was cursed in Jewish scripture, making it highly improbable for any of his descendants to sit on David's throne. So, even if Jesus were to inherit his family line through Joseph, it wouldn't bolster his credentials as the Messiah. The genealogies presented in Matthew 1, 
and Luke 3 also raise eyebrows. Some Christians suggest Luke's list pertains to Jesus' mother, Mary. But this interpretation doesn't align with Jewish tradition, which emphasizes paternal lineage. Besides, Luke 3.31 places Mary in a different branch of King David's family, not the one from which the Messiah is prophesied to come. Beyond genealogy, the Messiah is expected to fulfill other prophetic mandates, like ushering in an era of peace and universal monotheism. However, these expectations remain unmet in Jesus' time and thereafter. While some Christians anticipate these prophecies to be fulfilled upon Jesus' second coming, such beliefs find no scriptural basis in Judaism. Regarding Jesus' relationship with Judaism, certain gospel accounts may appear at odds with Jewish beliefs. For instance, Mark suggests Jesus declared some forbidden foods clean, though his intentions remain ambiguous. Nonetheless, Jesus and his early followers adhered to Jewish customs. However, the New Testament's assertion of Jesus' divinity contradicts Judaism's strict monotheism. In historical Jewish texts, Jesus is portrayed in various lights. Josephus, a renowned historian, mentions him, though later Christian interpolations may have influenced his writings. The Talmud references a figure named Yeshu, likely Jesus, depicting him negatively as a deceiver who met a grim fate. However, these accounts reflect a complex interplay between Jewish and Christian narratives. In the eyes of prominent Jewish scholars like Maimonides, Jesus falls short of messianic expectations. Instead, he is viewed as a figure whose teachings led to Jewish suffering and religious upheaval. This perspective underscores the theological chasm between Judaism and Christianity, where Jesus' role remains a subject of debate and contention. The Function of False Prophets and the Unholy Trinity In the cosmic battle between good and evil, just as God embodies a divine trinity, Satan mirrors this with an unholy trinity that wields control over the world. This dark triumvirate comprises Satan, the Antichrist, and the False Prophet, each playing a sinister role in perpetuating evil. Contrasting with God's trinity, which operates for benevolent purposes, Satan's unholy trio seeks to execute the greatest evils imaginable. In this twisted mirror image, Satan represents the malevolent counterpart to God the Father, the Antichrist corresponds to God the Son, and the false prophet mirrors the role of God the Holy Spirit. However, it's crucial to dispel misconceptions about the false prophet's identity. Contrary to some theories, this figure isn't primarily a religious leader. Instead, the false prophet assumes the role of an economic czar under the Antichrist's dominion. In this capacity, they wield authority over both religious and economic spheres, enforcing the infamous Mark of the Beast. As a de facto worship leader, the false prophet compels universal allegiance to the Antichrist, bridging economic control with religious obedience. This pivotal role links the economic machinery of the Antichrist's regime with the spiritual submission of the masses. The unfolding of these events culminates in the prophesied Battle of Armageddon. With the Antichrist at the helm, a series of cataclysmic events unfold, ultimately leading to a climactic showdown. The Antichrist's march against Israel, echoing ominous desires expressed by past figures, sets the stage for a monumental clash. Amidst the chaos, unexpected challenges arise as diverse armies converge from various directions. The emergence of the Eastern Army, crossing the Euphrates River adds a new layer of complexity to the unfolding drama. In the surprising turn of events, the Lord Jesus Christ returns, becoming the common adversary for the warring factions. Former enemies find themselves united against this divine opponent, marking a pivotal moment in the apocalyptic narrative. The Battle of Armageddon sees the triumphant return of Jesus Christ, accompanied by His holy ones and legions of angels. His mere presence exudes unmatched power, bringing about the destruction of all rebellious forces with a word. The aftermath of this climactic clash is depicted vividly in the book of Revelation, as God summons birds to clean up the devastation left in the wake of Christ's victory. This dramatic culmination marks the revelation of Jesus Christ to the entire world, signaling the triumph of good over evil. Following the apocalypse and the defeat of the Antichrist, Jesus Christ establishes His reign, ushering in a new era of peace and righteousness. He dismantles the power structures of evil, confiscates their weaponry, and causes their coalitions to crumble, heralding the dawn of a new age under His benevolent rule. Who rejected the Lord met their end. In the grand tapestry of theological discourse, few topics evoke as much contemplation and awe as the concept of divine judgment. 
Among the myriad depictions and interpretations, two monumental scenes stand out. The Judgment Seat of Christ and the Great White Throne Judgment. These pivotal moments serve as the climax of human history, the culmination of all earthly deeds and destinies, and the ultimate reckoning for every soul that has walked the corridors of time. At the Great White Throne Judgment, a scene shrouded in solemnity and awe, the stage is set for the final judgment of unbelievers. Every individual, from the dawn of creation to the twilight of time, will stand before the Almighty. The books are open, not mere volumes of ink and parchment, but chronicles detailing the entirety of their existence. Deeds wrought, words spoken, and the very whisperings of conscience. Among these sacred tomes, one holds paramount importance, the Book of Life. Its pages, inscribed with the names of the redeemed, serve as the litmus test for eternity. Those whose names are absent face a fate most dire, eternal separation and suffering in the unquenchable flames of the Lake of Fire a chilling destiny foretold in the apocalyptic visions of Revelation. This solemn judgment signals not only the end of earthly existence, but also the culmination of Satan's nefarious influence. In the aftermath of the harrowing conflict known as the Battle of Armageddon, the false prophet and the beast find themselves consigned to the depths of Hades. Yet Satan, that ancient adversary, is not met with immediate damnation. Instead, he is bound, fettered by divine decree, for a span of a thousand years. His final destiny, shrouded in mystery, remains undisclosed, a testament to the inscrutable workings of divine justice. But even in the face of such uncertainty, one truth remains immutable. The triumph of righteousness, the victory of light over darkness as heralded by the great white throne. Following the millennial reign of Christ, a period marked by unparalleled peace and prosperity, Satan meets his ultimate fate in the lake of fire. Joined by his malevolent companions, the false prophet and the beast, he is cast into the abyss, consigned to eternal torment. Theirs is a dreadful destiny, a stark reminder of the consequences awaiting those who reject the grace and mercy of the Almighty. While discussions of judgment may stir discomfort and trepidation, they serve as a solemn reminder of God's immutable justice, an essential facet of His divine character. However, beyond the veil of judgment lies the promise of God's eternal kingdom, delivered unto the Father in a momentous revelation. The millennium, that golden age foretold in Scripture, stands as a testament to the boundless grace and mercy of the Almighty. During this era, humanity experiences a foretaste of heaven, a realm devoid of death and decay, where life flourishes in its purest form, and the radiant glory of the Almighty illuminates every corner of creation. The writings of theologians such as Dwight Pentecost offer profound insights into the significance of the millennium, portraying it as a time of unparalleled blessing and fulfillment. Here, humanity experiences the fullness of God's redemptive plan, basking in the warmth of His love and the splendor of His presence. Even amid the darkest moments of prophecy, God's grace and mercy shine forth as beacons of hope. Throughout the tribulation, He sends forth witnesses and messengers, a testament to His unyielding love and compassion for humanity. These signs serve as a poignant reminder of God's unwavering desire for our salvation and His provision of eternal life through His Son, Jesus Christ. As we navigate the tumultuous waters of life, understanding these prophecies isn't merely an academic pursuit, it's an invitation to know and embrace the boundless love of our Creator. When we stand before Him one day, may we be ready to answer the question, why should I let you into my heaven? With unwavering faith and confidence in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. The urgency of this decision cannot be overstated, for Scripture reminds us, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. The time to secure our reservation for eternity is now, for tomorrow may be too late. Let us heed the call of divine grace, for in the embrace of our Savior we find eternal hope and everlasting peace. As we draw to a close, I hope these insights have sparked contemplation and reflection. Remember, amidst the complexities of life and the mysteries of faith, one truth remains constant, the enduring love and grace of our Creator. As we journey forward, may we hold fast to hope, embrace the light of truth, and walk in the path of righteousness. Let us live each day with purpose and intention, knowing that our choices shape our destiny and our faith anchors our souls. Thank you for joining me on this exploration of profound themes and timeless truths. Until we meet again, may you be blessed with peace, joy, and the presence of the divine in every step of your journey.
Farewell, and may the grace of God be with you always.